just repeating that slide that I uh, put up earlier on general linear models, this is just to reiterate that general linear models do encompass both regression and ANOVA and more complex forms of multiple regression, ANOVA with two or more factors. And what the key thing that general linear models will also do is allow you to use the properties of ANOVA, with which fits groupings of the data, and regression, which allows you to fit continuous measurements in the model, allows you to combine those. That also comes under the umbrella of general linear models. Just to reiterate that again, with ANOVA, you're fitting categorical effects. You're fitting groupings to your data. So the model could be written something like this, with an intercept term, one or more categorical effects, and an error term. Regression, you're modelling continuous effects, so measurements. These, these x's are measurements, so this is a multiple regression model. And you've got like several slopes for the different measurements that you're fitting in the model. And so the general linear model, which is often called a GLM, you can fit both categorical effects, you can model both groupings of the data, and you can also fit continuous effects. So it encompasses, as I said, ANOVA regression and models that have got both categorical and continuous effects in them. So I've written it a bit like this. And actually, these categorical effects, you could denote them by sort of XIs, where the, um, instead of being a measure, they're going to take just values of naught or, or one, but I won't kind of go into the detail of that, but basically it all fits into this general linear modelling framework, so you can assess both categorical effects and measurements at continuous data in the same model with a general linear model. So if we look at an example of that, we, we had this example where we were looking at different strains of mice and the effect of the injection, and we just analysed red blood cell count taken after they'd had either a sham injection or an active injection um, in the last analysis. But actually, before the study started, they had red blood cell count measured before they were even given the injection, and that's recorded here. And if we were to plot red blood cell count before treatment against red blood cell count after treatment, not surprisingly, you find that mice that you know, have a tendency for high values before treatment also had a tendency for high values after treatment. And therefore, we can take this into account by adjusting for what their pretreatment value was in the model by using a general linear model. But the key thing is, whereas strain and injection are categories, this red blood cell count before treatment <coughs> is actually a measurement. So it's not a category, it's a measurement, but we can still put it into the model. So that's how we could write the model. This is the model that we had before with the interaction, and now we've put um, pretreatment red blood cell count as well into the model. So we've got a continuous measurement in the model too. And the effect that this will have is it's going to adjust the results for red blood cell count. So if there's any difference in red cell blood cell count in the groups before treatment, it's going to adjust for this. And if we go back a minute to this slide, it would be more, if I'd, if I'd produced the means for both the groups, you might be able to see this more clearly, but if you, if you look at that, you can see that the blue dots tend to be lower for both red blood cell count pre-treatment and post-treatment than the, the red squares on average. So it does look like there is a bit of a difference in the groups already before treatment, and we want to take that into account in our analysis if possible. Fitting this red blood cell count before treatment allows the results to be adjusted for any differences in it between the groups. Just a couple of notes here. Sometimes when you're putting continuous effects into the model, like uh, this one, you call them covariates rather than factors. So that's something to note. And occasionally you hear people talk about analysis of covariance, and that all that means is there's a covariate in the model. It's basically just a, a generalised, a general linear model, but sometimes people call it analysis of covariance. This is the original model that we had earlier, and we had the p-values for each of the effects fitted. And now if we include red blood cell count in the model, we get a row coming in for red blood cell count, which is highly significant, so it's saying there's a lot of variability in the data in 
post-treatment red blood cell counts, which can be accounted for by the levels the mice had before treatment. So that's actually made the model more efficient and it has the effect of adjusting our um, tests for strain, injection and the interaction for these pretreatment differences in red blood cell count. And what we find now is the interaction isn't quite significant. It's still sort of a bit borderline, so I think we're still justified to go on and investigate. The injection has an effect for the individual strains. So generally that's a, a good thing, unless there's sort of definite reason why you don't want to adjust for the pretreatment values. It's a good thing to include pretreatment data in the model because it does make it a bit more efficient. And we'd go on in the same way to see which strains, for which strains the injection had an effect. And sure enough, just the same one I think we can identify has a significant effect. So for C3H, the control is different from chlorum. So although the interaction p-value changed a bit, we're still able to show that there was a significant effect there. That's just a similar table where we had to pick out the, um, the p-value for the, for the strain that we were interested in and the other strain which turned out to be non-significant.